Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sandy Ansari, educational therapist. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to a um, well-known author and someone that I admire in, on YouTube. And uh, his name is Dr. Don Carveth. Dr. Don Carveth is an emeritus professor of sociology and social and political thought at York University and is a training and supervising analyst in the Canadian Institute of Psychoanalysis and the past director of the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis. He's also the past editor in chief of the Canadian Journal of Psychoanalysis and author of The Still Small Voice, Psychoanalytic Reflections on Guilt and Conscience, uh, Carnac 2013, and Psychoanalytic Thinking, a Dialectic Critique of Contemporary Theory and Practice. Uh, he's an active lecturer, as I mentioned, and uh, on YouTube and has a private practice in Toronto. Welcome, Dr. Carbeth. Thanks, thanks, Sandy. I Good really, to be with you. Sure. I really enjoyed your uh, last uh, lecture uh, on uh, the culture of narcissism, as you put it. Uh, are psychoanalytic perspectives on guilt still relevant in the culture of narcissism? So that was a really robust lecture and it was uh, very thorough. Is there any way you can sort of distill that in a, in a few sentences or tell me what, what you meant by are psychoanalytic perspectives still relevant in the culture of narcissism? Sure. Um... What, what I presented was actually one of the chapters of the book I've been working on, and it's nearing completion, and it should be out next year uh, from Rutledge. It's called Guilt, uh, a Contemporary Introduction. Uh, so it's a little tricky to try to summarize in a few words what, what I'm actually taking a whole book to try to say, um, but, but let me try. Um, um, I think there has uh, been a flight from guilt. Well, from the dawn of time, people have been fleeing from guilt. We, we want to evade guilt because guilt is a very unpleasant, painful emotion. But psychoanalysts uh, from Freud up until some point in the 1960s, psychoanalysts knew about guilt, uh, not just conscious guilt, but unconscious guilt, um, and they grappled with it, both in theory and in therapy. Psychoanalysts knew that people who are very guilty but don't know it come with all kinds of other complaints, guilt substitutes or guilt equivalents. They come with anxiety attacks, they come with depression, they come with headaches, they come with rashes, they come with all kinds of things that they have no clue have anything to do with guilt because their guilt is unconscious. Um, in the 1960s, psychoanalysts started forgetting about all of this. They started turning away from Freud and Klein. And they started turning away from the superego because the superego is that part of the mind that inflicts the guilt, that yeah. beats us, that judges us. Um, there was a flight from the superego uh, in theory and in practice. Uh, in the paper, I cite Sandler and Arlo who both noticed uh, in the late 50s and throughout the 60s that psychoanalysts just weren't giving presentations on the superego anymore. They weren't sorting their case material in terms of the superego. Um, there was this shift to what I guess today is called relational psychoanalysis, uh, the shift to Heinz Kohut self-psychology, um, interpersonal kinds of psychoanalysis. And in these approaches, superego and guilt get short shrift. 
Why is that? Uh, because I think psychoanalysis, what was going on in psychoanalysis was echoing what was going on in the wider culture. If psychoanalysts were fleeing from guilt and superego, so was the society. And I would say that the society comes first and psychoanalysis echoes. I mean, uh, psychoanalysis, like everything else, uh, everything else in the culture, is highly influenced by what's going on in the socioeconomic substructure of the society. This is my Marxism coming out. Um, the, the, the world of ideas, the, the arts, religion, culture, all of these things reflect what's going on in the economic substructure of the society. And the society was changing in the 1950s from an industrial capitalism to consumer capitalism. Uh, in, in, in industrial capitalism, people are molded and shaped to save, to invest, to put their pennies away, not to spend. But when we shift to consumer capitalism, the whole system depends on people spending, spending already, enjoy, consume. And children are programmed. I saw a recent uh, documentary about how babies and children are shaped by advertisers in the most <sighs> devious ways to get the kids to turn into seeing consumption as the whole reason for being. Yes. Uh, so we're all turned into these rabid consumers. And, um, and we're turned into people who don't understand the word no. We can't say no to ourselves. We find it really hard to say no to anyone. We, we come to hate regulators. These people who want to be party poopers uh, and say no to us. Regulators, and of course, neoliberalism in the economy is an attack on the regulators. <laughs> the regulators, when they're through working for the government, they go into the corporation. Uh, and they're rewarded for not enforcing the rules before they ever get to the corporation while they're still in government. I mean, there's a, a deregulation is the essence of neoliberalism, free market, they call it, free market capitalism. So there's an attack on regulators in the society, and the regulators in the self are the superego and the conscience. Uh, so we're attacking self-regulation in, 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 in the psyche at the same time as there's an attack on regulation in society. Mm. That's how I see it. And does that have to do with the, 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 are you describing that as the culture of narcissism then? Or that is, is that the culture of narcissism because narcissists are people who don't want to hear the word no. Uh, they, they don't want to say no to themselves. They don't want people saying, I want what I want when I want it. And, and the culture of narcissism, culture of consumer capitalism turns us into these big babies who just, you know, want to be fed. And what's next? When's the new iPhone out? Uh, you know, so, uh, so the society feeds our greed. It stimulates our greed. It stimulates our oral desire to consume. Um, and we don't want to hear the word no. We can't stand limits. We um, can't stand limitations. And we hate people who try to limit us and put limitations or boundaries. So the narcissist is just the man of our time or the woman of our time. Uh, they don't want any boundaries. They don't want any limitations. Um, and, and so at the same time as this was going on in the society, uh, society uh, psychoanalysis itself was turning away from the people, who, uh, from the parts of the mind that do the limiting, superego, conscience. Psychoanalysis was in flight from guilt and superego as narcissists themselves are in flight from guilt 
and superego. So psychoanalysis was simply echoing the culture. Sure, sure. So are we talking only uh, unconscious uh, guilt that's gone into the unconscious or just repressed or is it dissociated? Because in, with the culture of narcissism, we're also seeing a lot of psychopathic tendencies where there is just the complete utter lack of empathy and perspective taking. Uh, Let's sum it up in, in two words, Donald Trump. Uh, he embodies, he's, 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 the, he's the emblem of the culture of narcissism carried all the way. I mean, look, there are degrees, mild, moderate and severe degrees of narcissism. But at the extreme, you get the malignant narcissist who is basically a sociopath. I mean, right. uh, he, 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 he doesn't just want to float regulars, he wants to float the law. Okay, but, the law is the ultimate regulator in many ways. I'm just wondering where the, these, uh, the super ego or even the conscience, where is it going? Like, is it, there's an attack on it. So what's happening is there's a flight from it. Right. So that's what I'm. Well, okay, there's a flight from it. So um, we can't what? get rid of it. We can't get rid of it altogether because it is a part of the psyche. Um, but one of the ways we can get rid of it is by projecting it outwards onto all of those horrible party poopers, those mm -hmm. people who want to set limits, uh, those uh, socialists who want to force capitalism to restrain itself or to modify or modulate itself. Um, they become the hated government i mean if you're a republican you i mean a modern republican old republicans used to support the superego but it's been taken over the republican party uh, they projected onto government big government is big daddy and he wants to squash us and he wants to prevent our businesses and he wants to interfere uh and he should be kicked out of town Okay, so the superego is projected onto, again, the government, the mm. FBI, mm. the police. Outside, the outside world. Outside, and, and, and of course, nowadays, there's this authoritarianism and this kind of sociopathy on the right who want to attack all regulators and regulation. But now we have it on, on what some people call the left, but I don't even, I hate them calling it the left because it's not my left. I'm old left. That is, I'm the left that is a cr critic of capitalism, but we have this pseudo left now and we get the same kind of thing going on, authoritarianism. They want to attack the regulators too. They want to defund the police. Okay, and they want to break the law and they want to burn police stations and smash things. So there, we have lawlessness on the right and we have lawlessness on the left. Now, does that have something to do with individuals not being able to be self-regulated? And so everything's just pouring outward? Yeah, uh, self-regulation, yeah, I think self-regulation is very hard to develop in the culture of narcissism because the culture says you shouldn't have to self-regulate. You should have whatever you want and as much of it as you want. Um, you see, self-regulation means saying no to yourself. Um, a, a person who can't say no to himself or herself is in big trouble because, you know, they're no longer able to say, oh, I've had one glass of wine. No, I will not have another. Or, you know, they, <laughs> uh, they can't control their eating. They can't control their drinking. They can't control their drug taking. Everybody goes to extreme because we've lost the capacity to say no. We can't be faithful to our spouses because here's this person over here inviting me to go to bed with her. Uh, why not? You know, I mean, uh, I can't say no. Why should I say no to myself? Monogamy? 
those laws about fidelity, I'm supposed to, you know, <laughs> so yeah, that's self-regulation, saying no to yourself, lost art. I'm also noticing that with, because I work with children uh, and I'm noticing that with parents and children, they're, they're not able to tell their children no more video games after four hours. Exactly. Um, and eat fast food. I mean, the parents actually don't have the capacity to. Okay, even... here's why. Here's why. You can't say no to other people unless you can say no to yourself. How are you going to say no to someone else when you can't say no to yourself? See, if I'm going to say no to my kids, that means I have to be able to say no to myself. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. So uh, I, I, I would like you to sort of differentiate a little bit more super ego versus conscience. Now, I was watching um, Pinocchio the other day and uh, uh, when the cat and the fox come by to sort of seduce Pinocchio, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, Jimmy Pleasure Cr Island, taking him yeah. to Pleasure Island. Or first take him to uh, not to go to school, like his father wanted him to go to school. So at first, you know, Jiminy Cricket, his external conscience comes and tries to save him, but he gets put into a glass jar because the cat and the fox figure out that he's not going to be useful for their, you know, goals. So suddenly the conscience is restrained and unable to have a voice. And yes, he goes to Pleasure Island and ends up with, you know, a donkey's ears and donkey tail, which I, I'm correlating that to super ego, you know, against the self and mm -hmm. conscience as sort of this right versus wrong, you know. So is that sort of what you're... Yeah, it's uh, an amazing tale. Uh, I wrote a review of uh, a book, uh, edited texts uh, about guilt. Oktar, Sal Salman Oktar edited yeah. the book. No, him. And, sorry? I know Dr. Oktar. You know sorry. Salman. Okay, so, so he edited this book for, based on a conference uh, in Philly. And one of the authors, one of the papers in the book is by William Singletary, and it's all about Pinocchio. You'll really enjoy that chapter. It's brilliant. Okay. Uh, because Pinocchio is just a wonderful allegory of this whole problem of conscience and narcissism. I mean, Pleasure Island is, is narcissism island. Yes. Uh, you know, I got it confused in my mind with, uh, what, 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 what's Largo? What's the Florida estate of Trump? <laughs> Something Largo. Um, uh, Pleasure Island. Um, I, I think of it also as, uh, is it, Jeff, is it uh, Jeffrey Weinstein, the sex guy? He had the island, sex island. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Pleasure Island. Um, yeah. Conscience is put in in a, in, a, in a glass jar or something. He can't, or Pinocchio is, he can't hear his conscience anymore. Uh, that's the condition of narcissism. You can't hear your conscience anymore. Conscience is very different from superego. Yes. Uh, superego is the socially internalized rules, the folkways, mores, the laws that we learn, we internalize our parents, superego, yes. uh, school, so, teachers, all of that. That's the superego and it's punitive. Yeah. So in Pinocchio, I thought, you know, him getting the donkey ears and, you know, after he was done with the nose. Yes. Yeah, so Every I thought time he tells a lie. Yes. Yeah, so that's how his superego is sort of attacking himself. Yes. 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 In like the body even. Yeah, you know. exactly. And the superego attacks our bodies, as I said. Um, you know, rashes, uh, um, headaches, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic right. fatigue, you know, all of these psychosomatic and hysterical conditions are ways the superego inflicts pain on us. The other day I had a latency age child come into a uh, session and he was uh he had his phone in hand and he was watching a he was playing a video game that had just come out and he was just ticking away 
as he was, you know, doing that. And uh, I'm seeing a lot more of that. Uh, just children are, you know, playing all kinds of video games, but at the same time you're seeing, I don't know if there's a correlation, but at the same time, I'm seeing all sorts of symptoms, more, more symptoms like ADHD and ticks and- Ticks. Uh, yeah, you know. and that's interesting because, you know, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, analysts were saying that mainly due to the rise of feminism and maybe some familiarity with psychoanalytic ways of, of thinking, um, the old hysterias, ticks, paralyses, globus hystericus, these things had disappeared, or you might find them among certain quotes, um, backward people like the Amish maybe, or maybe some parts of the Caribbean or whatever. You might see some of these old hysterias among these quotes, backward people, uh, but due to the rise of feminism, that's all gone, and now we get the new hysterias, fibromyalgia, environmental illness, uh, et cetera. That's all nonsense. The, the old hysterias never disappeared. You got this very modern kid and you're seeing ticks. I, I had a very modern patient, a stockbroker, flew his own airplane, wealthy guy. He had globus hystericus. At power lunches, he had to go up and spit out his food because uh, he couldn't swallow it. Um, so we, we have the new hysterias, but we still have the old hysterias, and, and th th these are all painful. You see, the superego just wants you to have pain. And, and so there are a million varieties of pain you could choose. Uh, if you didn't like having headaches or globus hystericus, you could find yourself uh, a terrible woman and marry her, and she's inflicting pain now, so you don't have to have the symptoms anymore. Or if you're a woman, you could marry a terrible man. He's abusive, and uh, now you don't have to have symptoms because you've got him. Ah. The bottom line is you got to have the superego wants you in pain. In one way or another. One way or another. Hmm. So are psychoanalytic perspectives still relevant right now? It's it, You're sort of suggesting that there's a new, there ought to be a new spin or there ought to be this concept of conscience and this distinction and- Right. And right. I, I'm, yeah, the, the positing of conscience as separate from the superego, that is a new spin. That's my spin. I'm not the only one. Uh, Carl Jung actually in 1958 wrote a brilliant essay on a psychological view of conscience. He got the importance of the distinction between uh, conscience and superego. I didn't know he had gotten that because I'm not a Jungian, you know, but uh, some, some friends have alerted me to this and I read it, it's a brilliant essay. Uh, the Australian um, uh, analyst Symington got this distinction. Um, my old mentor, Eli Sagan is the one who drew my attention to the distinction. Uh, so it's been floating around, but mainstream psychoanalysis has not, it refuses to go this way. Freud in 1923 folded conscience into superego, and that has made it very difficult for us to see conflicts between conscience and superego. Um, you know, Huck Finn is a product of a racist society, but he's on the raft with his friend, the runaway slave Jim. But in his mind, Huck is thinking, I've got to turn him in. Uh, but his conscience is saying, but Jim I, is my friend. Um, he's having a breakdown due to the conflict. Um, uh, but we, we've not been able to really think about that in mainstream psychoanalysis because we fold the conscience into superego. Um, so in that way, I'm proposing that we reverse Freud's 1923 decision and we open up conscience as a separate structure with a separate origin. I mean, superego comes from society and much of what comes from society is immoral. Racism, sexism, heterosexism, that all comes from society. Right. You know, it's, it's as if Freud thinks that what comes from society is good. No, most of our evil comes from society. And conscience comes is built in biologically. We the primate studies, uh, the ch the studies of very young infants at Yale, all show that we have an intrinsic biologically based 
uh, preference for good over bad. We prefer kindness over cruelty. When they, sh they, they show these little dramas to children, the children always choose the stuffed toy that's the helper. And of course, they're, they're also identifying with their nurturers who are helping them. Uh, and, and so there is this biologically based conscience, which gets suppressed, of course, in many people. Uh, I mean, a psychopath, it's not that he doesn't have a conscience. As long as he is alive, he has a true self. And, he, and yeah. yeah, it's just buried, deeply yeah. buried. So it, it, as a separate category, it almost sounds like you're saying like, conscience is good. Yes. Super yeah. ego is bad. The devil. Good, bad. If you want to get theological, conscience is the vox dei, the voice of God. And the superego is the devil. Even if it's stopping you from, even if it's punishing you from guilt, but I'm sorry, punishing you from pleasure, too much pleasure, let's say. Well, let's put it this way. If you can't hear your conscience, maybe it's a good thing that you at least have a superego. Wait, right? say that again. If you, if you can't hear your conscience, it's a good thing, I guess, that you can hear your superego. But the superego is cruel. Uh, maybe it stops you from doing certain horrible things, but it then wants to beat the shit out of you for even wanting to do those things, whether you do them or not. I mean, the, the superego is sadistic. It's immoral. It pretends to be concerned about morality. But the reason it loves to catch you in immoral acts is because then it can justify beating you up, which is what it wants to do. Okay, that makes more sense. So my- um, uh, Can I just finish answering your previous question, which is, is this some new turn in psychoanalysis? What I'm saying is that the turn towards separating conscience out from superego, that is a new turn. But part of what I'm saying in this paper, the subtitle is, are older psychoanalytic perspectives on guilt still relevant in the culture of narcissism? I'm saying we need to go back to Freud, Abraham, uh, um, Arlo. Those guys, uh, worms are, uh, they understood the dynamics of self-punishment, masochism, uh, they understood people who fear success and are wrecked by success, people who commit crimes in order to get caught, people who stay in terrible relationships because they need to be punished. Uh, Carl Menninger's classic, Man Against Himself, but 1938 that was published, one of the best books in psychoanalysis about the ways that we unconsciously sabotage and clutch defeat from the jaws of victory. That's old psychoanalysis. That's original Freudian psychoanalysis. It's full of brilliant insight into the suffering people bring to us. We need to know about it. In some institutes, it's still taught, but a lot of the teachers and the students are eager to get over that old crap to get on to Stolero and cohood and relational and self psychology. They don't have a feel for this older stuff. Um, maybe after they practice for a while and they start to see how patients are unconsciously sabotaging themselves, maybe they go back and start to read something like Menninger and some of the essays of Freud, because that's gold. But we turned away from it. I see. I'm a conservative. I'm a conservative. I'm a, I'm a radical in terms of society, but I'm a conservative in terms of psycho. Look, I'm not saying that self-psychology and these perspectives, I'm not saying they didn't contribute anything. They contributed something. They broadened our knowledge. and But... The gold is back there with Freud and Menninger and these guys who understood how we, they worked with the unconscious because patients don't, patients, when they come in, they don't have a clue that they've got a guilt problem. It never enters their mind. 
they, they come in because they're having panic attacks. They, they, they have no clue that they're angry. Uh, and, and then they have no clue that they're beating themselves up because of their anger and their death wishes towards their boss, their wife. Do you feel like uh, as a, you know, a, a professor, do you feel like uh, your students are, students of psychoanalysis are having trouble even absorbing or understanding or digesting the material? Because I just, as a student, uh, noticed that, that my classmates, uh, you know, I had a 10 year analysis. And so I, by the time I started courses, I was, you know, I, I kind of could really grasp what was being taught. But my classmates, you know, now they have the two year training programs and they have the certificate programs and you're not required yeah. to basically know anything about psychoanalysis and you can take classes and you can become a psychodynamic practitioner. By the way, let me make the point that that has to do with capitalism. The psychoanalytic societies run these programs with very low standards. Why? To make money. And they put up with all kinds of crap from these students because they don't want to alienate their customers. <clears throat> well, what I no what I noticed was, you know, on one hand, you know, the full. I mean, we, this is a whole other discussion, but to go and undergo, you know, and to become sort of seasoned like yourself and become a supervising and training analyst, it's a very very long process. And yes, and. It is very very expensive it's actually yeah. more expensive than the two-year training so it's an i feel like it's an attempt to keep psychoanalytic perspectives and uh, information somewhat relevant and you and utilized by practitioners but what I, but what i'm saying is what i noticed was my classmates were not they were just seeing it all two-dimensionally they were they were not absorbing the material and it was re really rather frustrating. And in, in the, in the, when I moved on to graduate school and it was a psychoanalytically, you know, it was a, they were, they welcomed psychoanalytic, you know, um, thought, but they infused it with um, neurobiology. And so then you have half the faculty that were like secretly haters and, um, yeah. and were plugging like toxic stuff into the, you know, lecture. And so then you had the others. So it was, it's just, I feel like we're just in this strange crossfire of people that are supporting people that are, um, <coughs> right. Now it's psychoanalysis. Well, don't, don't get me going on neuro, neuropsychoanalysis. I think it's a huge resistance to psychoanalysis. And I understand why colleagues fall for it because so many of my colleagues are medical, medically trained. Now they clearly didn't like medicine because they fled from medicine into psychiatry, which isn't really medicine anymore, right? And then, and then they suffered from low status because psychiatrists are the lowest status among doctors, okay? Um, and, and then along comes neuropsychology. Oh, we're doctors after all, thank God. We've been doing this psychology stuff for years, but now we can say it's grounded in the brain. Look how the brain lights up when the superego is, who gives a damn? Uh, I drive perfectly well. Well, I used to before I went blind. Uh, I knew nothing about what was going on under the hood. I never was interested in what's going on under the hood. I have zero interest in the brain. I know it's there. You can't have a mind without a brain. I get that. Let the brain scientists do their thing, but it's largely irrelevant to psychoanalysis. And it's a huge excuse for not learning about the unconscious mind. Uh, but you're quite right about, you know, the, the banalization of, 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 of psychoanalytic teaching in these kinds of programs, even in the main institute programs. Uh, sometimes that's still pretty good in the actual full psychoanalytic training program. Um, yeah, it's, a lot of the students just aren't getting it. And as for teaching it in the universities, forget it. I, I told the story of the, the young psychologist I was supervising and she was hired to teach psychodynamic studies at a prominent social work school that used to be psychoanalysis friendly and the students would not allow her to say anything positive about Freud. You know, she said, yeah, he made many errors, et cetera, but they want, made her, wanted 
her to apologize. They made her, they were going to make her apologize for saying anything good about Freud. What is okay? this? Dynamic class. Wasn't she teaching a psychodynamic class? Psychodynamic class, but no, they wanted her to just bash Freud and she wouldn't. And uh, then she overheard them saying they were going to punish her for her refusal to apologize. So she quit her job and quickly got off campus. So it's bad in the universities. It's, it's start, that same nonsense is creeping into psychoanalytic societies itself. The political correctness, the cancel culture, which, by the way, is one of the main defenses against guilt, is to identify with the superego and scapegoat the others as the guilty one. I'm not guilty. I'm the accuser, not the accused. So why is psychoanalysis so taboo now? Well, uh, well, first of all, let's say that it's always been taboo, okay, to a certain degree. I mean, Freud was trying to talk about childhood sexuality. Uh, Ernest Jones spent 10 years in Canada. He had to get out of England because he was working with a family and with some kids, and he was talking about sexual Oedipal stuff with the kids, and, and he was accused of being a child molester. So he left England, came to Canada for 10 years, then went back. Uh, there's always been uh, a lot of hostility because Freud was trying to get past the censorship. He was trying, he was promoting free speech about, about forbidden topics like <laughs> the Oedipus complex, you know, children. Well, Juliet Mitchell wrote a book on siblings. She said, where there are siblings, murder is in the air. Okay, <laughs> that's true. They want to kill each other, you know. Uh, God forbid one of them should die because the other will suffer all life long from major guilt. Because yeah. my, my brother died and, and I in my heart of hearts know I wanted him to die. And when he died, I was part of me was gratified. Part of me was destroyed. Um, uh, well, we're trying to talk about these forbidden topics like a little boy's sexual lust for his mother. Um, you know, uh, how do you teach that today with a class full of social justice warriors? Uh, the new Puritanism. You can't. No, you can't. And and the the, be the best psychoanalytic theorists on sexuality say that sex, for, to be any good, it's got to be dirty. It's got to be transgressive. I mean, clean, wholesome sex. <sighs> Why even bother? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Kernberg, Robert Stoller, sexuality has to be transgressive in order to be worth having. Uh, how do you teach that in the new Puritanism, you know? Um, so it's getting really, really difficult to, well, it was like, it was like in the 70s that um, that book, uh, Social Amnesia came out. That was like decades ago. And he was saying society is remembering less and less faster and faster. So this brilliant knowledge of the way the unconscious mind works is being forgotten, even so how, in psychoanalytic societies. So how do we save Papa Freud from the belly of the whale? <laughs> well, I'm doing my best by talking to you and giving that lecture to Chicago, and I'm bringing out this book, uh, in which I'm trying to explain how important this insight into guilt and unconscious guilt, how important it is. Uh, I'm trying to write, uh, well, it's not easy for me to write simply because I know the world is not simple and I try to do justice to the complexities, but I think it's, it's, many of the chapters of this book are written in as clear and down to earth language as I can manage. Um, you know, look, I, I, a lot of patients who, who are operating, say, on the neurotic level, um, they come in with painful symptoms. And through our dialogue, I help them understand that they, A, that they are punishing themselves. And once they get the fact that they are bringing these things upon them, they admit, you know, they admit that um, they're doing these painful things to themselves. Uh, so then the question is, well, why? 
this looks like punishment. Well, what, that, that suggests you're punishing yourself out of guilt, but I don't feel guilty. Okay, you don't feel guilty, but um, when someone goes into court, the, the, the judge says, guilty or innocent? They say, they say innocent. Does the judge say, okay, you can all go home now? No, <laughs> you start looking at the evidence. The patient says, but I don't feel guilty. Okay. But look how every time you cheat on your wife, you get that rash or you get those headaches. Kind of looks like there's a, every time you accept something that falls off the back of the truck, you end up getting you know, whatever. Looks like there's a connection. You see, it's very important that I not be super egoist because my goal is to get him to see that he has a super ego and a conscience. Mm -hmm. If I if I get super egoish, then he dodges his own super ego by putting it all onto me. You've got a moralistic therapist, right? So I try not to be moralistic, but I try to help him see that he's got a moralist inside himself that he better find out about. And a lot of these people get it. You know, it's harder when you're working with paranoid schizoid people. That's a real, that's real difficult work. But with neurotics, I think a lot of analysts have gotten way too shy uh, about speaking directly to their patients, not moralistically, but just directly. You know, analysts are intimidated about speaking directly. You speak kindly, you speak in a friendly way, you ask a lot of questions. Um, but patients, I think neurotic patients can hear sometimes a lot more than we think they can. I feel like there's less and less neurotic patients out there though. And I more think that's true. and more just paranoid schizoid. And that's uh, the culture again. The culture is doing that to us. And so how can these techniques be utilized? Um, well, I think we roughly have two sets of techniques. We probably should teach it more distinctly than we do. We should train therapists. Here's what you do when you've got a neurotic patient. Here's how you have to work when you've got paranoid schizoid patients. Um, and where you're right, we're dealing far more often with pretty paranoid all the way to psychotic. I mean, the Lacanians have this concept of the ordinary psychosis, and that's a brilliant thing because they understand that there are a lot of people walking around and going into work and doing their jobs, but basically they're psychotic on some level. Shengold helped. He brought out a book called Delusions of Everyday Life. For a while, we thought delusions were had only by psychotics. No, everybody's delusional to some degree, mild, medium, or severe. Uh, so there's a lot of psychosis around um, and plenty of borderline around. Psychotics are actually easier to work with than borderlines. Uh, I've had a lot of success working with mildly psychotic people. Um, borderlines I have less success with, severe borderlines. Mm. Have you, do you work with adolescents? Uh not really. I didn't have the training. I didn't have the child or adolescent training. Uh, occasionally, like an 18-year-old or something will become my patient or did. Now I work with older people. I work with men in their 70s or their 50s. I work with women usually who are in their mid to late 30s or up. Uh, so I don't work with young people, no. But uh, my son, my son is in analytic training. And uh, He's 32. So anyone that I get who is like under the age of 50, I send them to him. <laughs> yes, I, I, I work with children and uh, who have, you know, learning disabilities or are on the autism spectrum uh, uh -huh. and or ADHD. And I, I, I run groups. I do one on one. And I'm seeing some really interesting. I'm seeing that same parallel that you described you know, we see in the culture, I see something similar with children, but obviously it has a different sort of twist and uh, it's pretty scary. Uh, you know, there's a culture of narcissism with, with, with them and their parents. 
Yep. And certain things are just green light, you know, they, the overindulgence and, and at the same time, they're, they're not aware of, you know, their own internal worlds and parents don't know how to address their child's internal world either. And, and, uh, and well, I, I think child therapy, part of the reason I didn't do any child therapy training is that I taught, I taught in our child therapy program up here. I taught theory. <laughs> I couldn't supervise because I'm not trained in working that way. But I mean, many of those child therapists, ironically, like I taught them when they were in training and like 20 years later, uh, some of them attended uh, a 30 week clinical seminar that I conducted for like four or five years so that they could actually get supervision of their work with adult patients, because all of them had started taking and working with adults and they weren't really qualified to work with adults. So they were trying to get the qualification because they really didn't want to do child work anymore. Why? Because as soon as the kid makes some progress, the parents pull them out of therapy and refuse to pay. Because if the kid changes, that puts all kinds of stress on the parents. Parents have been using the kid to some extent as a scapegoat or a container for their own. <laughs> My wife found uh, a little, she's an analyst. She found a little cartoon and there are these girls sitting around five or six years of old. They're sitting around having a little sleepover or something. And the one girl gets up and says, well, I have to get home because I'm the glue that holds my parents' marriage together. Well, how true is that? I mean, these kids, you know, if the kid gets well, the marriage sometimes falls apart or other bad things start happening. Uh, the, the kid's pathology is the direct echo of the parental pathology, as you perfectly well know. Yes. And so what's the what's going to happen to these kids like 20 years from now at the rate that you are seeing this culture of narcissism? Well, they're not, they're going to have all kinds of psychological problems. Uh, what are your Yes, like as compared to right now, where we are now, like a 20 year old versus a two year old that in 20 years, what are they going to look like? What kind of symptoms are they going to have or what? What how kind are of they symptoms is the 20 year old going to have? It, like in 20 years, if, uh, uh, like oh. uh, they're born well, right now. Post well, COVID. it's going to be severe narcissistic personality disorder. It's going to be just uh, it's just going to be a deepening and a and, and a more more severe version of what we're seeing already. Uh, lawlessness. Some of them will go all the way to criminality, delinquency, uh, lawlessness. Some will just be narcissistic people who can't really have a relationship because of re having a relationship means putting yourself under a law. I mean, you, you have to not, you have to be able to say, to be in a relationship, you have to say no to yourself. Not all the time, but sometimes you have to say no to yourself for the sake of the other. Well, there's an interesting idea we could talk about, sacrifice. I mean, to be an adult in this world, to be married, uh, to be a parent, requires a willingness to sacrifice. But the culture of narcissism doesn't know anything about sacrifice. It's just me, 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 more, 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 right? Sacrifice? I mean, I'm supposed to sacrifice myself for another? Give me a break. The narcissist doesn't understand that. He thinks it's utterly unreasonable and irrational. So a kid is not learning how to do any of this. He's gonna have real trouble, real trouble. It's gonna be worse, worse and worse. If there is a world 20 years ago, let's leave climate disaster aside. Hmm. Pretty I think that's a big thing too. That's a big thing because we all kind of on some level know the end is nigh. What do people do in the face of the, of the black plague? They danced and drank and fucked. Right. And, you know, there's all the companies are out there are willing to sell us everything while the whole thing falls apart. As the water rises, I'm in a corner guggling my last bit of vodka. Uh, party on. Right. On some level, the kids. No, they don't have much of a horizon of hope. Yes, that's what I'm seeing too. 
they don't have hope. Yeah, young people in their 30s are seriously wondering whether they should have kids or not. What are they bringing their kids into? Um, and hope, you know, someone recently asked me to do a, a video lecture on the subject of hope, and I think I may. Um, that's a big subject. I mean, how do you, how do you live without hope? Uh, I always have to have a plane ticket booked. Uh, mind you, my wife lives in another town, so I'm, I want to I want to get on an airplane and get down there and see her. Um, but I like knowing that I have a reservation uh, somewhere near a beach, uh, and on the cold Toronto winter days, I know that I will be in the sun in a few months. Um, without without a horizon of hope, it's hard to function. And hope is a reality based or is it a fantasy? Well, I think both can be good for you, uh, also bad. I mean, look, uh, if you are into a supernatural kind of religion, which I'm not, most of the time I'm not, except when I'm about to go into surgery. <laughs> <laughs> there are no atheists in foxholes, they used to say, and maybe also not in surgical uh, rooms. I don't know. But uh, mostly I hold my Christianity as um, values and ideals and metaphors. Uh, but occasionally I seem to move into a right hemisphere space where I'm taking it rather literally, not often. I mean, and I would never defend it intellectually, but the intellect belongs to the left hemisphere. That's only half of who we are. The other right hemisphere half has to do with the heart and the poetry and the emotion, you know? And so I hold my Christianity in both of these spaces. Usually the left hemisphere is, is prominent, in which case I'm an agnostic, and I love Christian metaphors, but I interpret death and resurrection metaphorically. Uh, but occasionally, occasionally, like when I was going for surgery, I changed my signature file on my phone, and at the bottom it said, I'm held by a hand with a scar. And uh, I mean, on some level, I, I don't believe that, but I feel it to be true. So I don't think I'm very afraid of death. I don't believe that I'm going to heaven or anything, but I kind of feel like there's a good object somewhere mm. and I will be welcomed home in some sense. I, I don't believe that, but I feel it. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> there's a split between our thinking and our feeling. We got these two hemispheres. Ian McGilchrist in, in uh, The Master and His Emissary describes Western civilization as a, a civilization that suffers severely from left hemispheric dominance. Reason, rationality is so celebrated, but you know, poetry, emotion, religious faith, these things are grounded in the right hemisphere. Well, I mean, that's, there's an integration, but I see the categories that you're describing. Yeah. Well, health is an integration. Health is an integration. He's saying we're very imbalanced. Yeah. Um, but hope. Uh, yeah, one has to have hope in order to be able to function in the here and now. Uh, because let's face it, life is not a picnic. It's hard. Um, Freud, Freud described um, human malaise, human malaise. He, this is the suffering that we have as humans that is nobody's fault. It's not civilization's fault. It's not mommy's fault. It's nobody's fault. It's just that being human entails suffering. It entails joy, pleasure, but it also entails pain, frustration. Um, in order to get through it, you kind of got to have hope for a better day. And it's hard to have hope now. What, you turn on the news, it's Ukraine war, it's this lunatic Putin, who's now talking about nuclear attack. And then there's climate change. And then there's floods everywhere. And then there's the recession or depression that's coming or whatever. It's hard to find hope. Right. 
I have one more question before we wrap up. Sure. <clears throat> uh, you yourself are, you know, uh, in the public domain, but it's, uh, you know, difficult material that only specific subgroups of people would be interested in, correct? Right. For folks that would are, you know, aware of psychoanalytic thinking or appreciate it, but yet it's still accessible to yeah. any. Uh, that could be a little bit dangerous. For example, we have, you know, other individuals who are um, on YouTube and they are extracting uh, all sorts of psychoanalytic material and sort of creating their own spin uh, within the culture of narcissism and uh, utilizing it sometimes in, in ways that are either productive or not productive. What do you think about that, given your own work uh, in the public domain? Do you mean, do I have a sense of being in danger, do you mean? Or what do you mean, doing harm or, or what people might do with it? Or what do you, I'm not sure quite what you're getting at. All sorts of sort of practitioners or self-help gurus uh, that are giving a lot of advice to people and, and they're you they, well, I'm they're quite critical I'm critical I put up a video called caveat emptor buyer beware YouTube video psych experts I was very critical of some of them they're very oversimplifying um, uh, you know the the 12 characteristics of the female narcissist how to blow the narcissist's mind blah 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 it goes on and on there's a million of them Towards the end of the video, uh, I, I, I was criticized by some friends for saying, but then I have to admit I'm one too, because I'm a YouTube uh, psych expert putting up, you, you know, but they said, I said, if by narcissism, you mean a need for an audience, a need for narcissistic supply, a need for attention. I certainly am narcissistic in the sense that I have a need for attention, but so does every artist, so does every singer. So does every poet, so does every writer. I mean, anyone who's creative has a need for an audience. And so that's the sense in which I called myself a narcissist. I did not call myself a pathological narcissist. I don't think I am. One, many decades ago, I was. <laughs> but that after years of analysis, I think I got the pathological elements kind of cured. But um, so I'm critical of a lot, they oversimplify. Mm. Uh, they and they give people certainty like you know you're, you're struggling in a relationship with your partner eureka he's a narcissist oh now i see i'm a victim of narcissistic abuse okay and now you've summed up your partner you think you know who he is you start to break up your marriage or whatever because with the help of a video expert you've defined him as this thing. Now, chances are he's much more complicated than that. Chances are your marriage is much more complicated than that. And I think that kind of thing can do a lot of harm. Um, hmm. You know, I mean, uh, the stereotyping, the objectification, uh, they, like these video experts would have a hard time understanding that tremendous song by Stephen Sondheim, Being Alive. He's, he's describing what you want in a mature marriage, the kind of partner, someone to hurt me too deep, someone who sits in my chair and disturbs my sleep and, and, and demands that I, that I be alive, that reminds me that I'm alive. Uh, this is a partner who challenges you. Uh, this is a partner who gives you trouble. Why is that good? Because you need to get trouble because there are things wrong with you and you, you need a partner who will point out what's wrong with you. Uh, also, hopefully what's right with you. But um, that's a very mature right. understanding of what a good relationship is. Although these um, you know, folks on YouTube are they have quite a following. I mean, uh, as compared to like, you know, you, you know, you, you're uploading like very like, you know, rich, dense material, you're being very objective and you have literature reviews uh, and it's un not accessible to like the general public, but, but it's, 
valuable. Uh, and so then, you know, we have people like, you know, Jordan Peterson that does the 12 rules for life and he has millions of people reading his books. And yeah. I, some people are benefiting, some people are not, but that's an extreme example. But it seems like there is a need for guidance. It's a hunger, a hunger. And, we once were a civilization that got its guidance from the churches, the synagogues and so on. And, and, and people have fallen away from that. And uh, who do they go for guide, guidance? And then there are these people who are trying to be guides, but they're doing it in a rather irresponsible and oversimplified way. And people go for it the way they always have. Um, you know, I mean, a good man, uh, Dr. Wolf, uh, he was a uh, he 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 was dealing with for a long time with people who came with pain and they couldn't find any organic basis and he thought he was doing humanity a service by giving it a name, fibromyalgia. Ten years later, he thinks that was the biggest mistake in his life because by giving it a name, you're in the checkout at the supermarket and there's Ladies Home Journal or whatever and fibromyalgia. Oh, that's what I have. Okay, now she defines her whole life, or he uh, defines his whole life in terms of this concept. He gives himself this, oh, it's a narcissist. My wife is a narcissist. I see. Um, ugh. So this has always been, this kind of oversimplification has always been there. But with the internet, of course, it's massive now. Right. Okay, well... Uh... Thank you so much for uh, letting me interview you. And uh, I hope it was enjoyable for you as well. It was, Sandy. Uh, uh, really good questions. Uh, really drawing attention to important issues. You're doing your bit to fight the oversimplification by doing these kinds of interviews. So good on you. Thank you so much. OK. All right, take care. Bye now. Bye.